Hey everybody, welcome back for another week of Chasing Frets, and this week I'm joined by Joe Gore. Hi everybody. And we're joined by uh, one of my old buddies and one of your longtime friends this week, Charlie Hunter. Oh, everybody loves Charlie Hunter. He's the coolest. Yeah, so how far, tell me about the when you first kind of showed up on, uh, when he first kind of showed up on your radar in San Francisco. Well, we'll come back to this um, when uh, when. Charlie talks a little bit about his past, but it was it was in the '80s. At some point, he was still a teenager, and uh, you know, at the time, there was a particularly vibrant live music scene here and in the nearby cities of Berkeley and Oakland. Um, and uh, uh, first encountered him as a real uh, hot stuff rockabilly player. Hmm. You know, you know, obviously a really talented kid, but playing in a, a style he had heard before. And within a couple of years, he would just morphed into what we think of as Charlie Hunter with his, you know, amazing funky touch and his incredible polyphony with the simultaneous chords and bass lines and melodies. And uh, wow, I don't know that I've ever seen someone explode in their ability and concept as quickly as uh, Charlie did. Yeah, and that's what we're going to talk about today is kind of the roots of his technique and how it's evolved. And just hearing him talk about moving from six string to seven string to eight string to seven string to six string over the course of his career and how those tunings have kind of worked in and out of themselves was was really interesting really interesting yeah he's he's you know it seems like charlie is just the very much the uh lifelong student Mm -hmm. and is always experimenting and questioning and changing his techniques it's not like he devised you know the eight string simultaneous guitar and bass technique, and said, "There, I've nailed it. I'll do this for the rest of my life." Yeah, he's always uh, poking and prodding and trying new things. So Charlie's going to be our guest this week. If you want to hit us up, you can reach us at chasingfrets at premierguitar dot com with any questions or comments. So let's uh, let's hop right into this first episode with Charlie Hunter. <laughs> All right, Charlie, thank you so much uh, for joining us this week on, on Chasing Freds. Your name was on the original list when I first came up with uh, the idea for this podcast, and I'm so glad we can have you on. Oh, damn. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Well, you guys are, are homies, so this is going to be super fun. Oh, this will be great. So the one thing, ever since I first saw you in a guitar magazine and then heard you play, the question that immediately pops in mind is, how does he do that? And, and is that a guitar? That's the second question I, that popped into my mind as a young teenager. And the one thing <laughs> I wanted to ask you is kind of about the roots of your technique and how you first kind of developed your own uh, finger style, your fingers, your, your way. Were there influences you had as, as a younger, you tried to emulate and kind of as a side version of that ended up on your own style? Oh, yeah, totally. And Joe knows very well because Joe has known me since I was really pretty young and starting out. But it's still, I still want you to answer the question because my sure. experience was, I mean, I think I, I first became aware of you when you were playing rockabilly in a band called the Grease Monkeys. Yeah. This, this would be in the 80s. You might have still been a teenager. Dude, we opened up for your band. But any, you know, you, I was like 15, dude. I was 15. Big City. Joe had a band called Big Stop. City, and and they were fucking killer, actually. And there were a bunch of, there were a few bands. There were the Looters. There was Big City, and there was another band. Freaky that, executives. Yeah, and but, and the, yeah, the of course the Freakies who were. We all had a people little I, scene, but anyway, you were yeah. playing. I mean, you were obviously a ripping player, but you were kind of playing like Brian Setzer, rockabilly. Sure, and then. It seems like I turned away for a year or two, and then you were playing with Michael Franti in Disposable Heroes of Hypocrisy, and like seemingly out of nowhere, you know, you'd you'd gone from a really good rock and roll player to a practitioner of this incredible, you know, contrapuntal technique, and how you went from A to Z so quickly (laughs) is still a mystery to me, low these decades later. Shoot, it wasn't that quick, though. I mean, I... You know, when I was about 18, I went to Europe because a friend of mine had a place I could stay for like a month in Paris. So I kind of became a street musician. And then I was there for like three years just traveling around, uh, playing on the street and really learning how to play. Um, And oddly enough, I didn't even know Tuck Andrus was in the Bay Area. You know, I but I got into him and I got really into Joe Pass when I was um, a street musician. And I spent every waking kind of minute studying that stuff and this was a time when 
you just really had to figure it out yourself. There was no manuals. There was no YouTube, obviously. There were no even instructional videos for this. The videos really were like, it wasn't a thing then, you know. And um, so really, Joe, I think it was like three or four years that we probably didn't see each other. And then um, I had just been practicing and playing like 12 hours a day as a street musician. And when I kind of felt like that was done, I went back to the Bay Area. Um, and that's when I connected with Michael Franti. And that's when we kind of uh, reconnected because of Club Commotion, which was kind of like the nexus of a bunch of uh, very uh, diverse uh, group of musicians at that time in the late 80s, early 90s. Well, from the outside, um, it felt like, you know, it, it made me wonder about Crossroads and Devils and things like oh. that. You know? <laughs> No devils, man. I tried selling, but they weren't buying. They're like, no, nah, no, nah, we're we're all filled up, man. We're all filled up. You know, too many, too many people from the Nixon administration, I guess, uh, at that time. But, um, but no, honestly, um, yeah. I, I mean, to answer Jason's question, really, a lot of um, Tuck Andrus, a lot of Joe Pass, and and honestly, the music that I I grew up with because of my mom, because she was a big part of that whole Greenwich Village. Uh, folk revival thing we had she had all the records growing up was you know my house was just filled with you know Robert Johnson and to to you know speak of the devil quote unquote but um uh and um you know Lead Belly Blind Blake Elizabeth Cotton that music was just going on around the clock and she would also take me to see you know people like Sonny Terry Brown and McGee and John Lee Hooker and things like that so there's a lot of uh that technical thing in my playing even though it may not seem like it um but yeah i mean i just came up checking that stuff out and and that's kind of where it started i guess where did the the step to go to a more extended range guitar come from well you know i got back from europe and i was working at subway guitars in berkeley um with michael franti and alvin young bloodheart and uh, alex skolnick they were all worked there too at the same time yep we all worked there and uh, this guy, Jorg Kulo, I don't remember if you remember Jorg, but... I don't um, know him, but I sure remember those other guys. Yep, you do. Well, he worked for Fat Dog for a while, and he actually took an old Vega arch top that was affordable for me at the time, and he turned it into a seven-string, because it had a pretty wide neck. And um, and then I just figured it out from there, you know, I was just really... Con I mean, I just was like crazily... I, I honestly had no life other than working whatever job I had and practicing as many hours a day as possible. Um, and there weren't enough hours in the day, you know, and I was so into it and so into trying to learn all this stuff. And, and also, again, I mean, this is like the late eighties. There's, there were so little, um, resources, so few resources. And, um, and I just was not, I was not, uh, on the school track either. It may have been easier if I had gone to school, um, but I imagine if I did, I probably wouldn't have come up with such a weird kind of concept to, you know. And what was this also the era where you kind of started to experiment with non-standard tunings? Yeah, I mean, the tuning I had on the seven string was kind of standard. I think I it was like an E tuning with a low A string, kind of what George Van Epps was doing. Um, and Lenny and then when I had too, Ralph right? No What's I think that? Lenny Bro had that too, low A. Lenny Bro oh, had a high A right, string, right. actually. Yeah, yeah. So his, um, and my life would have been a lot easier if I had gone that route because anytime you introduce low end to something, you're dealing with an exponential amount of trouble and, and scale length and all these things. But when uh, Ralph Novak um, made me this eight string, then I went to that EAD, AD, GBE tuning. And um and I struggled with that for a good I don't know probably ten years and then I moved on to like a seven string again with a different tuning and I, I kept doing different tunings to kind of find what the you know the evolution has just always been like okay well now I'm doing this kind of stuff and there's a lot of tricky shit going on I I need to figure out what this instrument actually does like it okay I can do these fancy fast tempo jazz bass lines and things on top um but it, it wasn't always fantastic at least to me it, it wasn't really what the instrument wanted to do so it's taken me you know 20 years or something to kind of try to figure out more what it wants to do do you have a go-to tuning these days 
Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm playing in this thing I call the Big Six, which um, I think the last time uh, Jason saw me, maybe it's what I was playing. I think so, yeah. But yeah, but it's basically like the lower three strings of a bass and the ADG from a guitar. And depending upon the instrument, uh, this I'm actually affiliated with this company now, Hybrid Guitars. We're actually making really fucking great instruments that are kind of pretty affordable for, for what they are. But we have two models. One is 28 inches to 25 and a half. And that one I will either tune G, C, F, C, F, B flat, or that same thing a half step down, depending upon what, what I'm doing at the time. Um, and the uh, other one is 30 inches to 27. And I'll either tune that to E, A, D, A, D, G, or one half step above that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of what I've been, been playing. I, I don't really play the seven string anymore. So I'm sorry. So you're playing a six string instrument? Yeah. Oh well, I I, I should mention that um, just this you know, Charlie just shared with us some tracks in progress from his upcoming album, and I I've only I only heard them a couple of hours ago, and man, I'm still buzzing. This stuff is is oh get out of here. <laughs> it's so well. It's it's got you know the it's you know Charlie's always been a you know a you know drop dead virtuoso, but this is um. Uh, I guess it's a record of Charlie Payton songs. Do you, are you a Payton man or a Patton man? Patton. Okay. Patton. Uh, I mean, that's the only way I know. I maybe I, I could I've be heard wrong. some scholars say he probably pronounced it Payton, but but I don't know. Okay, um, shit. But uh, it's, it's 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 an entire album of of Charlie Patton songs, the great primal you know Delta yeah. blues figure. Yeah. And you're using a language that, on the surface of it, is very simple, very gut bucket. Uh, you know the bass lines tend to be pretty, you know, you know, primitive and almost washed up bassy. You know, it's not yeah. that it's not that like fast moving counterpoint, but holy cannoli! The you know the the detail work. You know the the, the way well, you thanks, can play so so soulfully and expressively while holding down the bass. And the one that blows my mind the most, I think the track was. I'm thinking it's Miss, Mississippi Bull Weevil Blues. Oh yeah, where you're putting the basses right on the one, really tight, and everything on the upper strings is so far behind the beat. You know, it oh, sounds shit. like it's, it's <laughs> greased, and how you can be playing this metronomic time, you know, with your thumb and laying so far back and funky with the upper notes. I don't know how your brain processes oh, that. Oh, dude, thank you. I mean, it just it, all that just comes to the drumming thing. And I'm not even really thinking of it so much that way. I think, you know, being from the Bay Area, I'm just eternally trying not to rush. You know what I mean? <laughs> Especially for that East Bay vibe, eternally trying not to rush, you know. So that's kind of where all that came from, I think. It's 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 heavy stuff. And it's um oh, it's thanks, an interesting man. Uh, well, we've heard we it, you shared um uh you shared five tracks. Well what does the album have a title, a release date, anything you can tell he, us? Yeah, I mean, I'm hope I'm just the guy who's mixing it is this guy down in High Point, which is just 20 minutes from me, and he just had some flooding issues, so I have to not he I think in his church or something, so we have to go, and uh, that kind of messed the schedule up a little bit. But um, I'm hoping in another week or something to have it done, and it's nine tunes total. It's called Patton in Percussion, because I just. Well, I ha I was at home like everyone else, and I don't know. I spent all my life driving a van, essentially, and I didn't have any time to learn how to record myself or to have like a setup like most people have. And I have a friend, you know, James Santiago, probably, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. Everybody knows James. Of course, right? So <laughs> James, totally James Santiago is a guitar writer and a guitar tech guy. He's he's created a lot of the guitar tools and things that that we all use and. Mm -hmm. Um, he's a beloved figure in the in the guitar. Yeah, and he's a community. total mention. He's, and he's a damn good player too, you know. Yeah. Um, and his but wife he, plays he, with Dweezil Zappa. Yeah, yeah, and and Sheila's my home my home girl as well. But um, he um, hooked me up with this with Universal Audio, so I got an Apollo and Luna, and I learned how to use that shit. And I had not. I mean, I, I'm good, pretty decent at playing drums and percussion, but I had never learned how to like actually record shit because someone else is always doing that so i just took the last few months to learn how to do that and the way i did it was by recording this record and i i have congas and a cajon and shakers and pantero and all kinds of different percussion instruments here so i just you know put the click on and and um 
made these beds. Of course, a lot of the time I had to also think about the, uh, you know, the form of the tune or whatever, and and just played all these percussion beds. And then after I was done with that, I put my instrument on top of it. So, you know, uh, Patton in percussion, and it's kind of a riff on that old uh, Puente in percussion. Yeah. Which I don't know if you guys know that record, but that's a killer, yes, uh, killer yeah. record. So anyway, look for that. It's so I had I had I didn't know you were the sole performer on this. I was going to ask you who your drummers were. And oh yeah, that's me. <laughs> it's well, it's cool, and it's um, you can answer this better than I can. But for folks who haven't heard this yet, which I guess is everybody, um, it's yeah, they're blues covers, and yeah, there's a lot of that spirit in it but you're definitely not going for like a mississippi sort of sound it's more like uh you know there's the percussion and you get like tiny whiffs of cuba here and there and yeah the, yeah and there's a little bit of a hard bop feel like the you know this the simplicity and the funky bluesiness it's a it's not what you might assume when you're talking about a, a cover album of uh delta blues yeah and you know all those years of playing with great people like Bobby Previtt and Curtis Folks, and I just you got to have that juxtaposition. At least that's what what I like to bring that kind of you know that sneaky thing in there. So a lot of the percussion stuff, it's kind of some of them are kind of standard funk grooves, maybe a straight one, maybe a swinging one with like congas and stuff. But there's a few that's like one is like a real plena, which is a real specific kind of Puerto Rican feel, you know. And uh, and then a couple, they're, they're just various and sundry kind of feels. There's even like a six eight kind of vibe on one of them, and and, uh, and so I just decided like, well, what kind of feel am I going to do for this? And then I I did my best to to learn it and tore the living shit out of my hands playing congas for a week. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, if you ever see an old congero's hands, man, it's not pretty. That that is no. is really destructive to your body. Oh my God! Yeah, I do not recommend it. It's the funnest instrument in the world, but I gotta say, man, if I if I wasn't in this little room recording, if you have to play live and play live volume with a drummer, it's game over. Yeah, it's like it's, it's as bad as being a <laughs> ballet dancer in terms of destroying your body really fast. It's, it's pretty pretty not great, that's for sure. So, to touch back on the your your finger style technique, Charlie, in, in recording this record and tackling these tunes. Was there a particular technique breakthrough you had in kind of interpreting these Charlie Patton songs? Well, I don't know. You know, you guys know how it is. There's all, hopefully there's always a breakthrough of some mm -hmm. kind or another, you know. But, um, you know, I've been really studying a lot of Blind Blake because um, I just kind of, I, I feel like he's, you know how people always say, well, who's the best guitar player that ever lived? And that's kind of a ridiculous question because there's no, really no such thing. It's, it's such a, it is such a uh, um, objective kind of, uh, subjective thing rather. But with this, with, with, with Brian Blake, I, I kind of felt for myself that he's the greatest guitar player that ever lived for me because I feel like he does what with the guitar uh, what what the guitar does at its at its kind of base bedrock foundational level, which is it's not quite a melodic instrument, it's not quite a harmonic instrument, and it's not quite a rhythmic instrument. But you find a way to put those three things together, and it it kind of weaves this beautiful magic. Um, and, and I think there's no one better at that than blind Blake and the technical stuff he does. If, if you kind of study it and there's so many resources online, I will not lie. I went online cause there was times where I was just scratching my head. Like this is not humanly possible. You know, how is this dude doing this in 1928? You know? Um, but there's a lot of the stuff that he does. Honestly, most everything he does is in first position. He rarely gets out of first position. And all my, and everything he does with his right hand is with his thumb and his index finger, which is astonishing. And so I got into exploring that and I started to realize like, man, you can do almost anything contrapuntally with just that on your right hand, with just those two things on your right hand. It's kind of crazy, you know. So I got into that, trying to uh, explore that as a way uh, and it, it definitely gives a more immediate kind of sound, a little sharper sound in a way. Um, and then if I want to do more things where I'm really sitting in with a drummer and really 
playing some time and with chords and I'll, I'll do more of an open handed kind of thing. You know what I mean? But anyway, that's what I've been. So most of what really, we're hearing is, is, is just thumb and index finger. Oh, um, I think probably almost all of it is. Yeah. And you're snapping a lot too. There's a lot of, there's definitely a, you know, there's pulling a, it, pulling the strings, but, right? which is what, yeah, which, which is what I meant to say, like pulling the string out from the body and you get this percussive clack on the beginning of the notes. Yeah. I love that shit, man. I've yeah. always loved that, you know? Uh, and there's no better way to do it than that fucking thing where you got your first finger and your thumb and the other fingers are just kind of sitting on the sitting on the guitar, you know. That's a, that's one of the core, um, you know, technical philosophic debates about guitar technique is in a lot of schools of guitar, you work on, you know, like a pianist on, you know, giving equal strength to every finger so that you can, you know, theoretically do the most. But then you've got these characters like... Uh, you know, like, you know, Wes Montgomery or whatever, who were just playing astonishing stuff with just a, a, a single digit. And yeah, a lot of the blues players were just using the two. Um, yeah. It's a it's an interesting uh, crossroads in the development of your technique, whether you're going to kind of go for super powered, you know, 10 super powered fingers or just focus on the fingers that have the most natural muscle. Yeah. And also, you know, I realize that what my instrument does best is that, kind of that contrapuntal thing and that rhythmic thing and why not just go for that and and let everything flow from that let everything flow from the groove and the time and the feel and then you can make all your gestures from there i mean it doesn't mean like if you're playing body and soul you still got to play the damn changes but it doesn't mean you you have to clutter everything up with a lot of technique you know you know as i've gotten older i feel less of a need to do those kinds of um uh, I guess what you would call, you know, pyrotechnical, kind of those overtly impressive things that um, ultimately I find very few people, people can really do that stuff and maintain the feel and maintain the groove and maintain uh, the vibe of the song. There are people who can, but I, I'm just not one of them. You know, I feel like I just like to keep the time going nicely and, and create the narrative from there. Uh, one thing, one thing that sets your polyphonic playing apart from you know some of your jazz predecessors who did do it. You mentioned, you mentioned you know Tuck Andress and Joe Pass, and you know I was a Ted Green student when I was a kid, and he Woo! was he was doing that stuff. But you know, but they they were definitely spinning simultaneous bass lines and and harmonic and melodic things. But uh, it seems like you, I'm not aware of anyone before you who went so far in separating the two voices you know when is not to take anything away from any of those players Ooh, but you know no. when joe Plas, pass does that it's you know he's doing this on the guitar strings and doing this on another guitar strings and it sounds sort of like two guitars playing independent lines but not so much like two instruments mm, playing mm. independent lines because your you know, your bass tone tends to be really distinct from your treble tone yeah um I mean, I guess so. You know, I think I also was always loved organ players and loved that kind of, um, you know, kind of self, that independence, you know, being, being able to just kind of be self-sufficient, you know. Um, and there's a certain satisfaction in the low end as well, you know. Um, and yeah, man, I always think about when I'm playing, I really always think about it in terms of, playing with a drummer or percussionist so that's kind of where the whole foundation begins for me and so having that real bass sound that really is percussive and can really i can play a quarter note in it and it hopefully means something you know um i mean like how like on a hammond organ you have a separate set of tone controls for the for the pedal register so you you it's on that that instrument is very idiomatic to create a distinct sound between the the hands and the feet yeah, and and I've been it's going to sound crazy, but I've actually been playing drums in a in an organ trio. And this kid, a uh, local guy named Sam Frybush, is a killer organ player. And I've actually this is the first time I've had a chance to actually see that shit up close and what they're really doing, like a, in a more intimate way. And it's really a trip because you know, like you said, they have everything divided. The upper manual generally they're playing chords. The lower manual. They're playing most of the bass lines, especially if they're tricky there, but they do a thing. If they're not playing the pedals to play actual tones, they pop a note, generally one of the black keys. They'll pop it very lightly 
But if you don't pop it at the same time you're playing your left hand, you don't get that oomph in the bass. And when I'm playing drums, if he stops doing that, it's like the whole thing disappears, you know? Hmm. It's a trip. Wow. I remember you telling me years ago that uh, Larry Young was a big influence on you early on. The yeah, great huge. Organ great organ player. And also because at that time I had just picked up this eight string and uh, our mutual friend John Schott told me, hey, have you ever heard of Larry Young? And I'm like, no, I never, I've never heard of him before. So he's like, well, check these records. So I got the records and I was like, okay, well, this is a good place to start because, I, you know, I fancied myself a real, uh, you know, I fancied myself a jazz musician. So let me, let me dig into this stuff at, at the time. And it was, it was really hard. It really kicked my ass. But Unity. Unity. Yep. Ooh. Yeah. And, and that also, that one, um, there's a Grant Green record talking about, called talking about that's got a bunch of really cool it's got elvin jones on it you know mm -hmm. so to wrap up this episode uh charlie if if you were to have a, a guitar student who's pretty proficient with pick style or maybe even hybrid picking and they wanted to just drop the pick altogether, what are some ideas or concepts you'd point them to focus on to get that real solid contrapuntal fingerstyle technique together well <laughs> joe's smiling because he knows what i'm going to say i think um I would say to really invest in playing some drums or percussion instruments, like really invest in that. Even if it's just playing a, sh a simple egg shaker to a metronome or to a, a record or something like that, really um, get inside the pocket, really get the feel of what you're doing, really come to the instrument before you even start trying to play con counterpoint stuff really deal with some percussion stuff or drum stuff if you have a kick a snare and a hat or even a kick snare and just a ride cymbal really try to learn some basic beats on those things um because if you do it this way when you go to the instrument you will have already internalized those feels and you'll know technically how it's supposed to sound before you get into the weeds of trying to figure out where you're hitting the strings at what time so you'll you'll be way ahead of the game if you if you go into it and you're trying to do a lot of tricky contrapuntal stuff with a lot of rhythmic integrity i think it's going to be really hard you're always going to be playing catch up because you don't have an internalized um idea of how it should sound you know and and it makes it harder but then technically i would say to do what we talked about like um to try to uh to learn how to play with your thumb and your index finger. The reason I, ha I tell people to focus on just their thumb and their index finger is because if you're using all the fingers, you're going to get into a situation where you're overwhelmed by all, trying to keep all these plates in the air and what am I doing with these fingers when really everything you need to establish a good groove you can do with your thumb and your index finger. Um, and uh, for instance, if you let's say you're playing a bass line that's just quarter notes with your thumb, right? Like ba boom 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 boom. And then with your your first finger, let's say you get a two note chord where you're just going doing a Charleston vibe, like rank bang, right? But bang boom bing doom bing doom bing right rank doom bing and let's say you want to do a little lick. Well, your thumb is playing quarter notes, but what's it doing when it's not playing quarter notes? It's waiting to help the first finger out. So, and when that happens, if you're a pick player, you already know how to do that. Because if you're going to play a line, the down stroke is your thumb and the up stroke is your, your finger, your index finger, right? So it's kind of a ready-made thing. It's not foreign. It's, it, it's much less of a foreign concept. And if you start there, then you can start adding your other fingers on your right hand, you can start doing trickier shit with that if, if you want to, mm -hmm. you know. Dig it. All right, Charlie, we thank you so much for joining us today and yeah, the rest of this week. Stuff. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to have him back, uh, Charlie, later this week for a couple more episodes. And until then, we'll see you guys later. Mm -hmm.